I hope your break was nice. I hope you ate and slept and probably did exactly what you've been doing for the last, since March, however long we've been in quarantine. I, I hope your uh, Thanksgiving sort of extended weekend was exactly like quarantine, but more relaxing. And you feel like you deserve that time at home. You deserve this, this amount of additional quarantine. That it didn't feel like additional sentencing. All right. Well, I hope everybody's healthy. And this isn't you're not being tested on this. So I find it interesting and write it down if you want. Uh, sort of, you know, tune out if you'd like. Today, it's the cellular mechanisms of, of fatigue and the muscle burning. And sort of the fire of it all, the muscle burning, you know, the sensation, right? You're, you're doing, to me, it's, it's leg extensions are the burniest thing that I've ever uh, done. But there's whatever exercise for you, it just hurts. You know, if it's lunges or if it's, seldom is it an upper body thing. Usually it's some sort of lower body thing, but maybe it's, you know, leg curls or leg press or or whatever it is. For me, it's leg extensions. Just you can keep going. I could do another 10 reps, but I decide to stop because it's burning. So that's fatigue of a kind. I'm voluntarily quitting, but I could keep going. It just hurts and it's uncomfortable and I don't want to do it anymore. So where does that discomfort come from? Where does it arise? Well, you have a nervous system. And the nerve's job is to detect things, to uh, reach out into the external environment, internal you, but external, the central nervous system, external, your skull and spine, right? To reach out into the periphery and detect chemical pressure, temperature, these different inputs and relay that message up to your brain. So your brain knows like, oh, this hurts or this is uncomfortable or, or, or warning, warning, right? You're threatened by something. So whatever environmental threat they detect gets sent up to the brain. And the nerves, they just, they don't like silence. We talked about this a little bit in the second section where, you know, I mean, there's some sleeping nociceptors that can be, um, you can you can wake those up and, and now they're problematic. But what, most of your of your nociceptors, your nerves that are submitting pain signals, most of these things, they just they don't take sabbaticals. Um, not even technically, if we're going to do the Leviticus twenty five definition of a sabbatical, it's a year. It's a it's a year where you don't like you know prune and harvest and you know whatever, but. The professorial version of a sabbatical is a semester, but the, like a nerve sabbatical, let's just say like, okay, go ahead and just take a breather for a while. Why don't we take today off? Nerves don't do it. They are vigilant and they're constantly uh, searching for anything that may be threatening to you. You know, it's an Annie Ann's pretzel. You're in a knife fight. Lightning is hitting you, like being, leg is being blown off by dynamite. I mean, maybe this this diagram is a little bit extreme, but but anything that is that is causing pain, the nerves are sensing that. And we even get phantom limb pains, right? Your leg is blown up, like the dynamite thing happens down here, or the knife fight just you know you cuts it clean off, and so you're missing a lower leg. Can't do Alfredsons with that leg, but you can still experience sensations, right? These phantom limb pains. Like you don't even have a limb there. Why is it hurting? Um, and so nerves are just picking up signals. It's like, you know what? We're going to send this signal anyway. I just, we, we had nothing to do. There's nothing, there's nothing distal to us. So why don't we just pretend there is and start sending signals? And what's called the Gansfeld procedure. There's, there's scientific literature on this. Um, I've never done it. I, I, I've had students in the past who have done it or, or been you know, exposed to it in, in some capacity and said, no, 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 it works. So, but I can't give you firsthand experience that this thing works. But the idea is you put ping, you cut ping pong balls in half, put them over your eyes, take on this facial expression for some reason, have some white noise machine going or you're floating in water, or you eliminate all sound, whatever it is, where you try to minimize any input, whatever stimulus, auditory, visual, 
kind of any palpation of, of any kind, try to eliminate any stimulus. And you don't have to do acid, right? You say, here comes the unicorns and the leprechauns. Here's a unicorn. Here's you know, the rainbows. And so the, the kind of hallucinations of, of extreme imagination apparently arrive, and it doesn't take all that long, if you just eliminate input, eliminate sense, give your nerves nothing to do, and they will make something to do. They will invent playtime, right, if, if you don't give them any deny a kid, you know, TV and video games and, and whatever, and they'll invent, you know, their, their imaginations will, will, will start to take over. So that's what the Gansfeld procedure is. But the point is, nerves don't like silence. They want something to do. If you put them in timeout, they'll come up with something. And they're constantly seeking information about the external environment, right? Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it wet? Is it dry? Is, is there like, are you being cut up or squeezed too tightly? Is something poking you? Whatever it is, um, your nerves are sensing that. But they're also sensing the internal environment, right? What are uh, the, you know, gases and what are chemicals? So if you have chemotactic signals being sent around, you know, what's your pH? And so sensing things like what, what's the prostaglandin situation going on here? So nerves are detecting the internal environment as well as the external environment. And pH is just one of them. But, but if you detect it, that it's really cold outside, you know, it's, oh, it's really, you know, frosty outside. It's been cold here lately. I mean, it's in the 30s in, in Stockton. So what do we do when it's 30 degrees outside? Well, if we're forced to be outside, there's involuntary actions. We shiver, right? There's involuntary stuff that happens. Now, you can deliberately relax if you're, shiv if you're shivering, but there's this kind of automatic, autonomic uh, response that you're not in control over if you start shivering, but also there's voluntary stuff that you change, you know, whether you bundle up or you leave the cold and you sit in front of a heater, you build a fire. So there's voluntary and involuntary stuff that changes in the presence of of nerves and the presence of nerves detecting, you know, if it's hot, what do you do? Well, you sweat. That's going to be the, the automatic response. You know, you have your autonomic nervous system and it's going to do a bunch of stuff that you're not in control over. So, you know, are you in control of how many red blood cells you're making right now? Are you in control of whether your pancreas is spitting out insulin? Are you in control of your PLA2 activity? You know, there's stuff your body just does. There are automatic things it does, and you have no conscious control over any of that. Now, the conscious piece is like, I'm going to get inside and warm by the fire, or I'm going to take off some of these layers. I'm just, it's so hot in here. What, whatever it is, um, there's, there's automatic and there are uh, conscious activities. Um, so internally sensing nerves are really doing the same thing. Uh, your, let's say, uh, blood sugar is low. Well, you're going to get uh, hepatic glucose production. If your uh, pH is low, right, you get very um, acidic. What do you do? Well, you better buffer some of these acids. And, and so the body's going to make changes, you know, to gas pressures or or, or uh, pH or, or sugar or wh wh whatever it is, you know, blood pressure, you you're going to make a bunch of changes in response uh, to those things. And to try to get back to homeostasis, right, to always stay in that narrow survivable window, uh, which we began the semester with this, right, we began the semester with there's a narrow window of survival. And through these negative feedback loops, we're constantly trying to live within that. You start exercising, okay, you're, you are consuming oxygen, you are producing hydrogen ions, um, you're consuming sugar and carbs. And so let's try to manage this, right? Let's get that heart beating a little faster. Let's buffer some acid. Let's, let's reconstitute some carbohydrates, core recycle stuff. Let's with all of these physiological functions, the body's going to respond to exercise with to try to maintain homeostasis. So pH, as we talk about the burn, right here in the middle, this neutral range, right? We have milk and, and spit and blood, 
right? So there's, there's milk spitting blood there. You know, there's a bunch of stomach acid and battery acid and stuff over here, your vinegar and, and whatever, your lemons and, and bananas are pretty acidic. And then over here, you know, there's like ammonia and milk of magnesia. And, and so we're into this very basic section. Over here, we have this very acidic section. The neutral is your, is your milk spit and blood. And your blood may, may be a little bit more basic than spit, but you know, again, just another look at this at the same stuff. Um, very acidic, low pH, very acidic. Um, your vinegars and tomatoes and bananas and and lemon juices and stomach acids and very basic over here. Your nair hair removal that just stinks. <laughs> it's one of the worst smelling things. You know your your ammonia stuff like that, and then you know water and blood and spit and whatever uh, live in there. This one is just another look at the same thing. There's a ton of juices. There's a ton of let's get into um, sex organ juices here, and then for no apparent reason, let's include a lysosome, right? So let's get uh, here's some semen, and vaginal lubricant, and the, and and there's saliva, and right? there's sweat and urine and pancreatic and intestinal juices, and and there's all these sort of fluids. Then let's let's throw in a lysosome. So that little organelle with the with the hydrolytic enzymes that that mTOR uh, that it's work site of mTOR let's put that one in there for good measure that's the pH of this particular tier let's get some crying babies and evaluate their tears as your as a as a research experiment and and yeah, 7.1 or so and crying little baby tears. Um, these different bodily fluids, are we in feces? Are we in bile? Are we in sweat, sperm, gastric juices in men uh, compared to women? You know, where are we in our, in our juices? What's the pH? Now, if the pH gets too high, we die, right? pH gets too basic, right? We die. pH gets too acidic, right? Gets too low, we die. And it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much uh, movement away from normal uh, to have some pretty severe problems. To, to reach death is not that big of a departure. So we're constantly managing, watching, we're vigilant and trying to, to correct our pH. Now there's some sort of wacky nutritional advice of uh, this like pretend medical advice, you should eat an alkaline diet. Well, that's not how any of this works. That's not like, as soon as it hits the stomach, it, does, this is, it doesn't work like that. But, you know, exercise and buffering and what the body is actually doing in real life and in, in sort of real science, real biology, real physiology, ex -fis, we sense hydrogen ions. So you remember this slide. This is from our second section. And there's a bunch of stuff. There's your serotonin and bradykinins and prostaglandins, um, ATP. Remember tissue damage, you're going to release ATP. That's a neurotransmitter. There you see nerve growth factor, histamine, there's substance P. You know what all of this stuff is, right? There's CGRP, calcitonin gene-related peptide. But hydrogen ions are going to depolarize a nerve. Protons or hydrogen ions, this is your pH. When you're sensing these protons, hydrogen ion, there's just no electron. You can think of these things as just a proton, that's fine. Uh, the, the response is like, look, we're getting pretty protonated here. Uh, our pH is falling. Our P of hydrogen, right, is, is falling. And so we're getting an accumulation of these things. If this gets any worse, we have some problems ahead of us. We, we better start managing this, this problem now. And so remember, if, if something hurts, people change their behaviors. There's that voluntary component. If it's cold outside, what do you do? Well, you come inside. Right, you 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 eliminate the source of, of cold. You sit by the fire. If if you were if your clothes are soaked because you fell in a, a lake or something, okay, well take those off and put on something dry. Get in a, in a blanket, whatever it is. You change your behavior, and then also you're gonna you know shiver and stuff. But if your quads are burning because you're doing rear foot elevated split squats, if that's your exercise. And your quads are burning, some in savage, right? You're, you're, you're really fierce. What do you do? Well, you knock it off, right? You stop doing whatever exercise you're doing, leg extensions or the squats or, or lunging or whatever it is. You stop doing that. You, you eliminate the source of protons. You eliminate the source of the burning. That's what you do. That's why your body does that. That's why it gives you that input. Now, that's not the only source of muscle pain, 
right? That burning sensation. We all know what that feels like, but there are other sensations. If somebody, well, if you're injured, that's going to be a little bit different. Everybody has felt an injury. I had this anterior compartment syndrome where it just, man, it hurts, right? But it doesn't feel like you know, five reps past what you wanted to do on leg extensions, compartment syndrome. That's not what that feels like, but, but there is, there are types of pain. There are things that cause muscle pain. It was delayed onset muscle soreness. That's not pH. Um, if that's pH, there's something else that's wrong with you. Something more concerning that's wrong with you than DOMS and delayed onset muscle soreness. You know, your prostaglandins um, and bradykinins and stuff. That's not pH rhabdomyolysis. You should know what this is based on the second half of the word. Now people say, what's the, is it, what is it, rhabdomyolysis? Is that what people, I think that's what people call it. That's not a word, myolysis. Myolysis is the word, right? Rhabdomyolysis. You know what lysing is? To lyse something, you know, glycolysis, lipolysis, glycogenolysis, lysis, proteolysis, myo just means muscle, you're lysing muscle, rhabdo, I think it means like a rod or wand or something, you think of like a little Harry Potter, but um, so exertional rhabdomyolysis, I know people who get rhabdo, uh, one of the most successful people I know, his name's Travis, he, uh, I, when we were doing our undergrad together, he was hospitalized for rhabdo twice to my, to my knowledge, maybe more that I, that I don't know about, but if you just, if you take some statins, you know, cholesterol modifying drugs, take some, have a little cocaine with your statins, some antipsychotics, and then just really go exercise hard. Yeah, you're going to get rhabdo too. I used to be able to really uh, push the exercise intensity and your muscle fibers are dying, right? Myolysis, you're, you're, you're licensing up some stuff here and, and they release their contents into the blood. Your, your muscle releases the contents into the blood and more than the kidney can deal with. That's what your rhabdomyolysis is, is you're, you are overwhelming the kidney. The kidneys can only clear so much creatinine or like a crush injury or something can, can do the same uh, phenomenon. And a normal level of creatinine, this breakdown product, maybe one milligram, I mean, give or take based on how much muscle mass you have. So male or female, but largely how much muscle mass you have uh, per deciliter of blood. You get up to like that three, four, five range. And we're looking at some some kidney impairment. And, and, and so th th this is not going to feel good, right? Rhabdo Myolysis. Yes, you're exercising very hard here. Exertional rhabdomyolysis. You're exercising very hard, but that's not the same thing, right? There's your creatinine. There's your there's your breakdown product, and you're going to have some of this in your in your blood. And, and again, just have a ton of muscle, and you're going to have more of it. But that's that's a different sensation. You know, if you have delayed onset muscle soreness, if you have an injury, if you have compartment syndrome, if you have rhabdo, these are these are painful experiences that feel nothing like a burning sensation. If you go to a weight room and just do a, a isometric hold, for, do a wall sit, or do a wall, you can do that at home. Do a wall sit and hold it for like 10 minutes and you get to about minute two and you're cursing my name. You get to minute three, you're cursing everybody else. Get to minute four, you're cursing life itself. But this is hydrogen ions is, is, is what this is coming from. Uh, your pH changes and your nerves sense it. Now, where do hydrogen ions come from? We'll talk about that. You already know the answer, but we'll talk about it a little bit. What normally gets blamed if you go to a gym, if you go to a basketball court, if you go to any sporting situation of what a personal trainer says, what normally gets blamed? And But what's the real culprit? You know this answer, and I think you know this answer too. Anaerobic metabolism and its, its byproduct, lactic acid, that's what gets blamed, right? That's what has been indicted, just like Turkey in our last lecture, right? Turkey was indicted for, for causing that, that postprandial lethargic syndrome on Thanksgiving. You overeat on Thanksgiving. Um, I did, perhaps you did, you overeat and ooh, you end up sleepy. Now I don't eat carbs really. I mean, there's carbs in everything. There's carbs in eggs, there's carbs in meat, 
you know, there's sort of glycogen in me. And, and so, but I, but I don't eat potatoes and I don't eat, you know, the jello and I, and I don't eat the pie and I don't. So, so I, I, eat on, I overeat on Thanksgiving and I'm stuffed and, and I sort of eat until the point of self-loathing but I don't really get sleepy, um, even though I've had a ton of tryptophan, right? So, so what gets blamed uh, for that that postprandial lethargic sensation is is the tryptophan because it becomes serotonin in the brain. But as we talked about before Thanksgiving break, that's not really accurate. The carbohydrates are really to blame. It's just counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive, uh, and so people go on blaming tryptophan. Seinfeld blamed tryptophan in. Um, the 90s, right, very famously, and everyone sort of blames this thing. It's the same thing with the uh, exertional burning, right, the muscle burning as, you, as you're exercising. What gets blamed is lactic acid. What causes the burning sensation? Lactic acid. Now, let, where does lactic acid come from? Read in the comment box. Some pitchers still run poles to reduce soreness because they think it's flushing out the lactic acid. It's such a common uh, misconception. Man, if I were lactic acid in life, if I were, if that were, if I were reborn lactic acid, I would be pissed that everyone hates me. Like, why do you hate me? I'm the good guy. I'm the good guy. You're mad at me. That would be lactic acid talking. That's me if lactic acid were conscious. So here is glycolysis. Now we're beginning with glucose, right? So we're not, this is blood sugar. We are not beginning with glycogen. If you begin with glycogen, you skip the hexokinase step. Hexokinase just converts glucose into glucose 6-phosphate. And uh, it's a kinase, right? It phosphorylates something. So what does it phosphorylate? Well, right here. So it, it, it converts glucose into glucose 6-phosphate. You can make glucose 6-phosphate, as we talked about in some earlier lecture, where you can make glucose 6-phosphate out of glycogen through phosphoglucomutase, um, and then before that, glycogen phosphorylase. So glycogen phosphorylase chops off a little glucose 1-phosphate, you move that phosphate, so it becomes G6P, right? So you just move it, and uh, with phosphoglucomutase. So, so if you're beginning with blood sugar, you're in a nerve, or you're like yeast or something, you're not like an exercising muscle fiber, you use hexokinase. So glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, you consume ATP there, you release a uh, hydrogen ion. So at the hexokinase step, you release a hydrogen ion, a proton, right? A hydrogen ion. At the PFK step, phosphofructokinase, we talked about that one. We talked about phosphofructokinase, the rate limiting step in glycolysis, right? So you use ATP there, but but ATP, if you have a bunch of it, can bind to an allosteric site. Do you remember that with, with uh, PFK? And, but you consume ATP there. And so you release a hydrogen ion. So, so far we're going through glycolysis from glucose, not from glycogen, from glucose, where we are, which you have like four and a half grams of. You, you have a pound of glycogen, but um, from glucose to, to G6P hexokinase release one hydrogen ion. So we're at one. PFK, you release one more hydrogen ion. Now you get to glyceraldehyde three uh, phosphate dehydrogenase, G3P dehydrogenase, you release two hydrogen ions because there are two reactions. Remember glucose, this is a six carbon molecule. Once you split it in half, you now have double the reactions because you have one reaction happening, but, but you, you do that reaction on two molecules. Instead of doing reactions on a single six carbon molecule as you do at both of these steps, you have a single six carbon molecule. So you only do those steps uh, once. You split it in half, and now you're working on two molecules. And so two three carbon molecules. And so each one of those reactions releases a single hydrogen ion. So at this point in glycolysis, if we begin with glucose, we go through hexokinase, PFK, and G3P dehydrogenase, and we have released four hydrogen ions, four of them. Hydrogen ions, this is your pH. The more hydrogen ions you, you release, the, the lower your pH, the more acidic you are, the more hydrogen ions you accumulate, protons you accumulate. So this far into glycolysis, we've released four. One here, one here, two here. We have four. A couple of steps where nothing happens with, with hydrogen ions. And then we get to pyruvate kinase. We're going to make our pyruvate. You consume two. You consume two hydrogen ions at this step. So if we go from glucose to pyruvate, we have released two hydrogen ions, two protons, pH, 
H for hydrogen. <clears throat> so release one, release one, release two, consume two, uh, a net of two being released. But this isn't where you don't end with pyruvate. You don't just say, okay, we have pyruvate and that's the end of it. That's not what happens, right? So we have these four. These three are really glycolysis proper, uh, you know, because hexokinase, you can totally skip hexokinase if you just go from glycogen, you don't use hexokinase. Um, use glycogen phosphorylase and phosphoglucomutase and then enter right after hexokinase. But um, glycolysis proper, just like if you live in, in LA, I lived in Chicago and uh, I was across the river, just barely uh, the, but it, it depends what your, I could walk downtown to Chicago and six minutes or something like that. And you'll know, be in the tall buildings and stuff. But if you, let's say it's like LA, there, there's a, there's a zip code for LA. And then when people think, oh, I live in LA, but they're like out in the suburbs and it's a different zip code. That's not really LA proper. Right, you're in the region, but it's not really LA proper. And so for, for glycolysis proper, where's the actual zip code of glycolysis? You're not in the suburbs. Um, phosphofructokinase, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase, and pyruvate kinase. These are glycolysis proper. These are three of the enzymes in, in the real zip code of glycolysis. Hexokinase, northern suburb. You can get into, into LA down here uh, through a different road. You can get in through uh, glycogen phosphorylase and phosphoglucomutase. Uh, you can get into glycolysis. You can get into LA through a totally different road. This is not the only road into LA. And then after pyruvate kinase, oh, there's there are uh, enzymes that are not in. in they're, they're the southern suburbs. And so afterward, if you convert it into lactate, you consume two more hydrogen ions. So once you create your your pyruvate, you don't just keep it. You're not a pyruvate hoarder, right? You don't have a storage shed filled with pyruvate and every time you make it, you just hang on to it and like, ooh, this will be worth something someday. I'm gonna get another storage shed and fill it up and someday I can sell this on eBay. That's not how you function, right? You, you create pyruvate and then you do something with it. Pyruvate has a fate, it has a physiological fate. It just, it's on the move, right? It doesn't hang out in a bank account. So what do you do with it? One big thing you can do with it is convert it into lactate and if you do that, there are two uh, molecules. So there are two uh, enzymes acting here. There are two reactions. So you consume two hydrogen ions. So if you begin with glucose and you end with lactate, right? If you begin with glucose and end with lactate, that is a net difference of zero protons. There is no change in your hydrogen ion count. If you begin with glucose and end with lactate, no difference, nothing changes in your pH. And yet people keep saying, oh, glycolysis and lactic acid. Now, what are you talking about? Glucose to lactate, nothing. There's <laughs> no change in your pH, right? Now, if you go from glycogen to lactate, you skip hexokinase. You skip the hexokinase step, you go glycogen phosphorylase to get G1P, and then phosphoglucomutase to convert your G1P into G6P. You bypass hexokinase, the first step in glycolysis that deals with a hydrogen ion is your PFK. So you are releasing one and then you release a couple with your glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase. But then you consume two with pyruvate kinase and consume two with lactate, you end up with negative one. So if you begin with glycogen and you end with lactate, you have, uh, you are removing hydrogen ions. You are becoming more basic, not more acidic. It is the opposite effect of what people blame it for. Now, again, you only have like four to five, I don't know, it depends how like huge you are and how sugary you are and, and how, you know, how much blood volume you have. And, but under five grams of carbohydrate in your, in your bloodstream, of glucose in your bloodstream. So you start exercising. Are you gonna use those five grams of, of blood sugar or are you gonna use your pound of stored glycogen? Obviously you'll die if you use blood sugar, right? And so you, we remember, we inhibit with this backward inhibition of enzymes based on the accumulation of the product. So if you go through 
<clears throat> glycogen phosphorylase and phosphoglucomutase to create a bunch of G6P. G6P backwardly inhibits hexokinase, so we actually limit the amount of glucose consumption by the muscles. We impair, we inhibit, we reduce the amount of glucose consumption by skeletal muscle during exercise exercise physiology. This is human bodies exercising. We're not talking about yeast, right? We're not talking about like yeast in a bio lab. Sure, fine. Yeast in a bio lab. This is what we do, right? Uh, fine. You're a human being, right? You have human being tissues and, and, and biological systems and, and organs and, and cells and, and exercising. You're going to be predominantly a glycogen consuming species, during exercise. And so what happens to your acidity? What happens to your pH during exercise? We'll follow the proton, right? Just track the proton and you know exactly what happens to you. Um, you become more basic, not more acidic by creating lactate. By going through glycolysis and generating lactate, you become more basic. So that, that glycolysis and its, its byproduct of lactate has been blamed for so many years for causing the acidity is the opposite of the truth. And yet people are still, um, as Jesse was saying in the comment box, that we still have these pictures trying to flush out the lactic acid. Like, I just, I, I, I don't know how much basic biochemistry I mean, it's not like this is a new finding. We've, we've known this for, for quite a while. The best article is the Robert's paper, paper, which I was just showing you. That's this one. This comes from the Robert's paper. 2004 um, is when it came out. It's sort of the final article on the biochemistry of, of lactate kinetics. And that's not new. Right, that's like 16 years old. In the 90s, you know, there's a lot of work by, I think Toflinetti is how you pronounce it, and, you know, 91, and George Brooks over at Berkeley. Uh, there's a lot of work by these by these giant authors, and even in 1970s, we see some preliminary glances at uh, lactate kinetics, and it's just not what people think not what people still say, not what coaching still says. So lactate dehydrogenase, uh, we're consuming a hydrogen ion on our way to the production of lactate. So if, if glycolysis is over, um, what do we do with the pyruvates, right? We generate a couple of these things and we can either throw it into the Krebs cycle, tricarboxylic acid cycle or Krebs cycle, the series of enzymes that's going to use your pyruvate, um, or you can convert it into lactate. So anaerobic make lactate and we consume a hydrogen ion and just shuttle it out of, um, we shuttle that lactate out of the muscle where it could have an effect. I don't really care what the blood pH is. The pH in the muscle is 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 really what what we're what we're worried about. And 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 let's consume the hydrogen ions and just ship them out of the muscle and let's send them to the liver. Let's make some new carbs out of them. You know, Cori cycle. Or you can do aerobic metabolism. Uh, and so we'll go through what aerobic metabolism looks like. But pyruvate three carbons, right? So you take sugar, six carbons, and uh, you know, your glucose or, you know, G6P, G1P, whatever your, your sugar, that's six carbon. You convert it into two, three carbon chunks. You, you, you lyse this thing, glycolysis, glycolysis, convert it into two, three carbon chunks. And, but like pyruvate, as you convert it into acetyl-CoA, acetyl-CoA has two carbons. Well, what happens to the third carbon? Well, let's release a CO2. It's carbon dioxide. Um, the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is three enzymes. There are three enzymes here, and I'll show you what those, uh, those three do. The third enzyme um, actually gives us a hydrogen ion. And so the uh, first one, the first enzyme gives us our carbon dioxide, gives us this. The third enzyme, which you don't see here, but it gives us our hydrogen ion. Um, so there's the first enzyme, there's the carbon dioxide, the acetyl-CoA, that's the second enzyme. Uh, the third enzyme, we're getting our, our hydrogen ion. So this complex, the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, and so we're going to get a hydrogen ion and a carbon dioxide with each pyruvate that we're using, with each pyruvate that we run through aerobic metabolism, with each pyruvate that we convert into an acetyl-CoA, a, a two-carbon compound that will be fed into uh, the Krebs cycle. So here's your oxaloacetate. And oxaloacetate is this four-carbon acceptor compound 
that your acetyl-CoA is going to bind to. So your acetyl-CoA, this little two carbon guy, is going to be fed into the Krebs cycle, will bind to oxaloacetate and make citrate. Citric acid cycle, tricarboxylic acid cycle, Krebs cycle, whatever you want to call it, undergoes a bunch of changes and emerges as oxaloacetate. So what happens? What's the fate of these two carbons, right? Because they bind to oxaloacetate, this little four carbon guy. This molecule citrate undergoes a bunch of changes. And at the end of those changes, it emerges oxaloacetate again. It's a Krebs cycle, right? It's a cycle. So oxaloacetate accepts this thing, becomes citrate, undergoes changes, becomes oxaloacetate again to accept another one of these. It's a cycle. What happens to those two carbons? Well, they're released as carbon dioxide, right? So you release a couple more um, carbons as carbon dioxide in the Krebs cycle. And so there's this one. What you see is a hydrogen ion and a carbon dioxide both being released, right? You see that carbon dioxide and the hydrogen ion. Um, go down here, you see the same thing, carbon dioxide and a hydrogen ion both being released. All right, so let's go back to this. Now, remember when I said earlier, what's a ketogenic diet? Well, if we are doing gluconeogenesis, we're creating carbs from non-carb sources. Let's go to the liver and make a bunch of carbs from things that aren't carbs, gluco, sugar, neo, new, genesis, creation. Um, let's create carbs from oxaloacetate. So oxaloacetate gets stripped from the Krebs cycle. And so you have your acetyl-CoA showing up to run through the Krebs cycle, but what do they bind to? There's no oxaloacetate anymore. Well, let's just bind to each other, right? We've both been stood up. A couple of acetyl-CoAs show up to the Krebs cycle. Uh, no oxaloacetate to be found. This was, I was supposed to meet at, you know, Arby's for my date and there's no, my date isn't here. Oh, you got stood up too, other acetyl-CoA? Well, why don't we go home together? And so we'll go on our own date. Um, and so that's the creation of your, of your ketones uh, begins with that. The stripping of oxaloacetate to make carbohydrates and then these guys binding to each other because the Krebs cycle now sucks. I mean, it just doesn't have an acceptor compound there. But we're, we're releasing a couple, if we do run our acetyl-CoA through the Krebs cycle, we're releasing um, these two carbons as carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions go with it. Now over here, you see another hydrogen uh, ion being released, another proton being released. So at the end of the TCA, the Krebs cycle, tricarboxylic acid cycle, the Krebs cycle, at the end of this, per, for each acetyl-CoA, so per acetyl-CoA that enters it, you have two carbon dioxides plus one from the pyruvate, uh, and then you have in the creation of your, of your acetyl-CoA, and then three hydrogen ions plus one from the pyruvate in the creation of your acetyl-CoA. And so you also, the way that you send your carbon dioxides through the blood um, is this bicarbonate, which is HCO3. HCO3, this is how you send your uh, carbon dioxide through the blood to the lungs. You're going to breathe this stuff out, right? You breathe in oxygen, you breathe out carbon dioxide, um, but you also breathe out, you know, nitrogen and, and, and the oxygen and whatever. But, but that's the idea of what breathing is. I mean, carbon dioxide is such a small fraction of everything, but, but the idea of breathing is like, we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide. We breathe out byproducts of metabolism. And, but the way that we get that uh, carbon dioxide to the lungs is as bicarbonate. So what we do is we bind it to water, H2O. So we bind carbon dioxide to water, um, H2O, and we get H2CO3, which is carbonic acid. H2CO3, carbonic acid. That's not really how we're sending it, unless we're very acidic. Um, that's not really how we're sending our carbon dioxide to the lungs. We're sending it as bicarbonate. So what do we do? We release that proton. We release the hydrogen ion. So um, each carbon dioxide we generate, there is an acidifying effect. There is a hydrogen ion generating effect with with each carbon dioxide we generate. So aerobically, we create some hydrogen ions and we create carbon dioxide and the carbon dioxide uh, is, is going to, likely going to release um, hydrogen ions. Um, it depends on the pH and it depends on conditions. Now, there are other fates for these hydrogen ions um, when we get into aerobic metabolism, but summing up, the contributions of aerobic metabolism. One pyruvate navigating the Krebs cycle, we got seven hydrogen ions.
Okay, what did we have from glycolysis? Well, even from glucose, if you remember the lactate, there's zero, right? And, and so if you go from glycogen, which is what you're doing during exercise, in, a, in skeletal muscle during exercise, there's a bunch of glycogen activity, you get negative one. And so what are people doing blaming glycolysis and lactate for this big generation of, of hydrogen ions? This is, not, this is not really how it works. Now, it gets a little bit more complicated when we're looking at the electron transport chain, um, stuff like that. But, but we end up blaming anaerobic metabolism when aerobic metabolism is more culpable, but that's not even really the culprit, the major, it's not really the major culprit, uh, but even creatine kinase, nobody would argue creatine kinase is aerobic. I mean, this is faster than glycolysis by a lot. So the creatine kinase reaction, right? We have creatine phosphate and we have ADP. How do we get our ATP back? Well, a hydrogen ion and creatine kinase, the enzyme, and creatine phosphate donates its, its phosphate to the ADP to make it ATP. And that, there's where that hydrogen ion goes um, on the creatine. So uh, even then, creatine kinase, we're consuming hydrogen ions. Glycolysis, we're consuming hydrogen ions. But uh, so pyruvate to lactate, lactate dehydrogenase, we're consuming the hydrogen ion to get all of that. So what is the largest source of, of metabolic byproducts that are going to be acidifying our tissues. Aerobic metabolism, I wouldn't even say is a culprit. Um, what I would say is ATP hydrolysis, right? ATP hydrolysis is so active, so constant, and so unclean in its pollution, right? I mean, this is the forest fire. And so you have ATP goes in, water goes in, and you lyse it, ATPase, that's your enzyme, you're gonna hydrolyze, you get your ADP, that phosphate, and the free hydrogen ion. And so you get that, that phosphate, the hydrogen ion, and the ADP, these are three major causes of fatigue. Now the hydrogen ion gets blamed for fatigue more than it deserves. It's not really that important for fatigue and we'll talk about that. The phosphate seems to matter a great deal and the ADP to ATP ratio seems to matter a great deal. And that's the only one we'll talk about today is ADP to ATP. But this phosphate, people will say an inorganic phosphate, a P and then a little I, inorganic phosphate. Notice there's no carbon there. There's a phosphorus and, and surrounded by you know four oxygens. Right? So that's your phosphate when you phosphorylate something, whatever. But ATP plus water, ATPase, your ADP, a phosphate that you chop off, and then that hydrogen ion. And then so what happens here, I've talked about this before, but you chop off the phosphate. And so there's the P, there's the phosphate, and um, you plug this up with um, an O and an H, right? You plug this thing up with an O and an H that leaves one H behind. So one O and an H go here, there's the other H floating off. So there's your proton, there's your pH change, there's your hydrogen ion. Um, so ATP hydrolysis, that's what the nerves are feeling. That's the burning sensation. That's the bulk of our hydrogen ion accumulation. So enough with the, with the lactic acid nonsense right? ATP hydrolysis, the hydrogen ion that accumulates from this in bulk. Now, remember these met values of things. And, and if you go to um, Barbara Ainsworth, her compendium that talks about all of these met values, these metabolic equivalent of task, this column is the met value. So what's the met value of hunting large game and dragging a big carcass, dragging around like elk carcasses or something? 11.3. What does that mean? 11 times your resting metabolism. What about hunting deer and elk? Well, six times your resting metabolism. You're not dragon game, right? What if you're bow hunting, crossbow hunting, whatever? Oh, two and a half times your resting metabolism. No matter what kind of animal you're murdering, there's a met value for it, right? Just go butcher, murder, and drag a bunch of a bunch of you know livestock and wildlife and whatever, and and there's a met value to correspond to that. These are published values and, and you know, general hunting, five times your resting metabolism, five times your resting ATP aces, right? Five times your energy consumption, five times the hydrogen ion accumulation, 
that's really where this stuff is coming from. And those hydrogen ions matter. Again, pH, what does P stand for? Who cares? Who knows? Power, potency, potential, who cares? Of hydrogen ions. And again, that nervous system is there to detect things and transmit those things it's detecting upstairs into your brain where it makes executive decisions and says, owie, right? It says, ouch, that hurts. I'm looking at all this um, hydrogen ion accumulation, maybe some ATP being released from damaged tissue and, and that doesn't feel very good, right? And then we're gonna make executive changes, behavioral changes. I'm gonna stop doing my leg extensions or whatever. Okay, a breather time. That is the end of muscle burning. That's where your muscle burning comes from. Does it come from glycolysis? No. Does it come from lactate? No. People blame lactic acid because you see this change in pH, right? You watch the pH change and you see lactate uh, enter the blood at the same time. And the first study that found that, I think it was Margari and colleagues in, in around 33, 1933, somewhere around there. And like, look at the, you know, 1933, look at this, this increase in lactate and fall in pH. One must be causal to the other. 1976, uh, yet Solin and colleagues uh, does the same thing in the, in the tissue. So at first we see it in the blood, Margaria, and the second we see it in uh, the tissue, Solin, 1976. And and people are, are convinced now, lactic acid, right? You build a bunch of, of lactate, build up a bunch of this stuff and, and pH falls and man, we found our culprit right there at the scene of the accident. But blaming, I mean, it's just the very next year, 1977, I think it was Jeevers looking at like, well, maybe there's more to consider here is, was when, when the very next year after Solon's work uh, that we, we start looking at, start questioning that model um, of, of lactate burning um, and, and pH change. Uh, and then, then we kind of question a little bit more and start doing that follow the proton exercise. And then we realize, oh, this is a firefighter. Um, this isn't the, the fire starter, right? This isn't the like pyrotechnics here. This is this is the, the firefighter. And it'd be the equivalent of, yes, does burning happen at the onset of a bunch of lactate accumulation? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Do firefighters show up at the fire? Yes, they do. But how often do we blame the firefighter for igniting the fire? Unless it's some like racket, if it's like, you know, old Chicago and, and like, oh, you're going to pay for fire insurance or we'll set your house on fire, right? If it's some weird, you know, firehouse racket, fine. But we don't blame the firefighters for starting the fires. They show up to the fire to put them out. That's how you can think of a lactate is does it show up with the fire? Yeah, it does. Does it add to the flames? Is it fanning the flames? No, it's not doing anything like that. It shows up and it's, it's more of a buffering agent than a contributor. So that's the end of, I hope forever, the end of the lactate is the enemy answer because lactate is wonderful. It's a fuel source in the heart. It's a fuel source in the brain. Um, you convert it back into sugar in the liver. I mean, it's, lactate is this wonderful thing. Good luck living without it. And yet everyone hates it and blames it. And so lactic acid that causes burning or crazy nonsense, crazy nonsense. Um, okay, so let's get into fatigue. Now, fatigue, one mechanism of fatigue is not the same thing as another mechanism of fatigue. So if you're going to do an isometric hold, like hand grip, just squeeze your hand for as long as you can and wait. And this thing is eventually going to release. So you can't just hold it there forever. It's eventually going to release. Um, do a wall sit. Eventually you give up, right? That's isometric activity. There's a there's an explanation for how fatigue develops. Now, how strong is this? You know, is how many kind of pounds of, of force are you generating? Are you holding dumbbells while you're doing your wall sit? These things, it, it depends. But the isometric development of fatigue is not the same thing as jogging, as aerobic fatigue. Set that treadmill at 10 miles an hour and go for as long as you possibly can there's a time at which you'll just fly, like fly off the back of the of the treadmill or jump on the sides to straddle it and whatever and say, I can't go anymore uh, and throw up on the treadmill and that flings off the back and hits the researcher or something. If you set it at six miles an hour, there's a different 
mechanism of fatigue that's going to set in. If you set it at 15 miles an hour, there's a different mechanism of fatigue. You're going to stop at a different point, stop at a different duration, and stop for different reasons. Um, let's say it's bench press. Let's say it's 135 pounds. How many reps can you do? Well, if that's your max and you can't do a second rep, that's one. There's a, there's a different mechanism of fatigue here than if you can do 135 50 times. If you do 135 50 times and you can't get a 50 first, that's a different mechanism of fatigue than if that's your max and you can't do a second rep. So it depends on what your RM is, your repetition maximum. If you have a 10 RM, a 20 RM, a 50 RM, a 1 RM, the, the explanation of fatigue differs. And a 1 RM is different from this and different from this. A 10 RM is different from this and this. And so uh, depending on your exercise, your activity, um, what it is that your tissues are doing, the demands, the situation, the available fuel, and all of these things are going to be ingredients for what determines fatigue, what determines the reason you can't do a 51st rep or a second rep, or the reason you can't hold this for another second, the reason you fly off the end of the treadmill at 11 minutes or one minute or 15 or two hours or whatever. And so these are the mechanisms we're not going to go through. There's other stuff, you know, circulation, some obvious things we're not going to talk about. But these are the ones we're going to go through. Now, we've already gone through tryptophan and serotonin, so we can check that one off the list. And some of you may have felt it over, over Thanksgiving, over break. But we'll go through um, pH. We did that one. But, but we'll talk about it from the perspective of, of fatigue also, hydrogen ions and, and, and fatigue. We'll talk about it. Today, all we're going to do is ATP, ADP ratio. But the three major ones, you know, pH, so that's your hydrogen ion, ATP to ADP ratio, right, these two, ATP goes into ATP hydrolysis, ADP comes out, and the phosphate, which comes out of ATP hydrolysis. So ATP hydrolysis, the consumption of ATP, gives us three flags that can be waved to say, hey, knock it off, stop all that activity, stop exercising. This hurts and the muscles are just going to uh, mechanically stop working if these things build up mechanically, it gunks up the system. If this builds up voluntarily, you decide to, to, to um, hit the abort button, right? Hit, the, hit that like, you know, cease button. And so these things are just consequences of ATP hydrolysis. Uh, but if you think about fatigue from the big uh, picture, how much calcium gets released from a sarcoplasmic reticulum? Remember the sarcoplasmic reticula, these are the storage sites of your calcium. Once calcium gets released, it binds to troponin C, and we get this uh, change in conformation, which enables actin and myosin to engage tropomyosin to be moved off of those binding sites on actin so that myosin can engage them. So you remember this from the first section, from our very first, from the beginning of the semester, um, calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And if you remember, um, the ryanidine receptor piece, that's, that's what lets the calcium out. A dihydropyridine receptor, that's sort of the finish line at the end of that excitation contraction coupling. So you have this alpha motor nerve up in your primary motor cortex, descends the spine, synapses, leaves. We're now out in the periphery. And then you get that neuromuscular junction at the level of the tissue. And then you cross, right? Acetylcholine crosses that cleft and binds to those nicotinic receptors on the other side, those acetylcholine receptors on the other side of that neuromuscular junction, and then goes down the T tubules, hits a dihydropyridine receptor, changes its conformation, um, permits the ryanidine receptor to open that channel for the, for the calcium to come out. So you remember all of that roughly from the first block. So causes of fatigue, how much calcium is being dumped from the sarcoplasmic reticulum so it can bind to the troponin C. Now, number two of the big picture items, how sensitive is the muscle to that calcium to enable cross bridge formation? How sensitive is that? Is it actually binding to the troponin C? Um, is something inhibiting the binding to the troponin C? Is, is the contractile apparatus sensitive to that calcium that was released? That's number two. Number three, how much force can the actual cross bridges themselves generate. So actin and myosin have to engage. And one, you, you know a little bit about this in terms of 
uh, the length tension relationship. In the length tension relationship, if a muscle is very stretched or very contracted, you're not getting as many cross bridges formed. You're not getting as many myosin heads binding to the actin, to those binding sites on actin, right? You just can't reach if it's too stretched. It's they're overlapping if it's too contracted. And so getting the optimal engagement between actin and mice. And there's other stuff. There are other physiological phenomena, not just length tension relationship. There are other physiological phenomena that can sort of mimic the effects of a length tension relationship at any length. You can impair the engagement of the, of the cross bridges or, or, or delay the cycling um, of them. So we'll talk about that, but that's number three. And number four, the final mechanism of fatigue is central fatigue or central governor theory. So central fatigue, central governor uh, theory, your brain, your brain saying, nope, no thanks, go ahead and sit down. And there are arguments that this is really what's going on. There are cellular mechanisms, either peripheral or cellular is how it's expressed. Um, one, two, and three, these would be the cellular mechanisms of fatigue or the peripheral mechanisms of fatigue. And central fatigue is going to be your brain saying, no thanks. Like, look, out here in the periphery, I'm detecting uh, an energy deficit. I'm detecting that the sugar is low, that the ATP is low, the energy reserves are, are reaching emergency status. I am not willing, this is your brain talking, I am not willing to suffer the consequences of energy deprivation. I, I'm a brain, I'm the most important thing. I am not willing to endure energy losses. The muscle go ahead, you can endure energy losses, but not me, brain, not me. And so I am going to shut you down, muscle, before that energy crisis reaches home, reaches the brain, reaches the central nervous system. So that's central fatigue. We'll talk about that one on Friday. We'll talk about these three peripheral uh, or cellular fatigue uh, you know, today and, and, and Wednesday. So these are all of them. These are all of our uh, mechanisms. And today, all we're going to do is ATP, ADP ratio. But so you're going to exercise. And you're, as we talked earlier about um, the compendium of met values, metabolic equivalence of the task, your METs, metabolic equivalence, running 14 miles per hour at a 4.3 minute mile, 23 METs. Now, this is a ballpark figure. This is, it's not like every single person is exactly 23 times their resting metabolism. You lie down on the sofa and watch Oh, the Charlie Brown, like, I don't know, like Christmas special or Thanksgiving. Is there a Thanksgiving one? The Great Pumpkin, maybe? Maybe that's Halloween. Um, so you watch some sort of like Charlie Brown thing, the holiday thing, and you're lying there and, and whatever it is you're doing, relaxing, and you have one met basal metabolism, one met. You're consuming, you know, one met's worth of oxygen and one met's worth of equivalent metabolic, you know, substrates. Now, get up from that sofa, shut off Charlie, and go in a full sprint. Just start, you're looking at like a 20-fold increase, maybe a 30-fold increase. Do, do like, let's put some dumbbells in your hands and put some weights on your legs and have you do that full sprint. Or, or let's have you do a full sprint in water where everything has this, this sort of isotonic uh, resistance up, up against it. And you, maybe you get a 30-fold increase in your metabolism. That is a lot of ATP consumption. Um, I don't know what the hell this is. Jai Lai, right? This is 12 mets. Um, but even just walking, just get that, get that sort of caffeine addled, walk as fast as you can, that, that awkward moment between uh, walking and jogging where your feet are still on the ground, but you look like one of those sort of hilarious gait speed walkers. And now you get up around 10 times your resting metabolism just doing that, right? And so the rate that ATP can be resynthesized, you're ripping it apart. You're hydrolyzing it up here really fast. The rate that you can put it back together, right? That you can, that you can like Humpty Dumpty it back together, not very fast. Glycolysis is remarkably slow. Creatine phosphate is fast. Um, you know, phosphocreatine and creatine phosphate, that's fast. Glycolysis isn't that fast. And, you know, oxidative 
phosphorylation, you're getting into to, you know, the oxidative uh, reconstituting of, of your ATP, really slow, super slow. And so your, your reassembly of ATP, this can be overwhelmed. And so you can start to deplete your ATP levels. Now, don't write any of this down. I'm not testing you on any of it, but if you're trying to uh, have a firm and, and comprehensive understanding of uh, fatigue of, of, phys of kind of fatigue physiology, this is the wrong place to start. Basic medical biochemistry, often this is where th these types of books are where you find the most errors. And so they're talking about, I mean, you see the adenylic kinase reaction here, right? Two uh, ADP and you're going to get one AMP and one ATP, right? So let's take from one and give to the other, sort of the like a middle class Robin Hood. Let's take from the middle class and give to the middle class so that we have one upper class and one lower class. But what what the values that they say, you know, ATP levels are, are approximately this and, and they decrease by no more than 20% during strenuous exercise. So again, let me say that sentence from this book, ATP levels decrease by no more than 20% during strenuous exercise. ADP levels may increase by 50% and AMP levels may increase by 300%. Now, 100% would be doubling. And so 300% is a fourfold increase. It just, it sounds weird. A 300% increase sounds like a threefold increase. It's fourfold because a 100% increase is doubling. That's a twofold increase. So. ATP, again, don't write any of this down because it's wrong. ATP goes down by no more than 20%. ADP increases, you know, can increase during strenuous exercise by as much as 50%. AMP may increase by as much as 300%. And so it looks like this. ATP goes down, you know, by a fifth. ADP um, has like this half increase and a MP has like this fourfold increase. Okay, that's a nice that's a nice story. But levels of, of ATP in the muscle, when people start evaluating this a little bit further, um, all right, let's look at some different exercise conditions and, and how much the ATP drops. These studies, you know, ATP levels, these drop more than a fifth, more than 20%, but we're not finding it to drop more than about 60 below, about 60% of resting value. So there's still more than half of resting ATP in the muscle. We're still reconstituting a lot of our ATP, and so we're preserving levels. So that's what these ones say. There's a problem, though, with how these studies are being conducted and the implications that they have. So size principle, you remember this, orderly recruitment or size principle, Henneman's size principle, where we have an order, there's a sequence of, of recruitment where the smallest, weakest, most fatigue resistant, most energy efficient fibers are recruited first. The most energy efficient fibers are recruited first. The most energy inefficient fibers are recruited last. That's size principle. If, if we're doing some sort of exercise and we're looking at the whole muscle, you are not going to see this great ATP depletion. Where will you see ATP depletion? High threshold motor units. You'll see those in the high threshold motor units. Those, AT, those type 1 fibers are not consuming ATP very quickly. And so if you isolate type 2X fibers and look at their consumption of ATP during strenuous exercise, you can bring it down by 80% to 20%. So uh, what gets reported in some of these textbooks is like ATP levels don't fall more than 20%. Not true. It depends on how you're evaluating this stuff. You can bring it down to 20%, not by 20%, to 20%, by 80%, not to 80%, by 80%. And the, the preposition matters here. And so uh, ADP um, levels, we're going to see a, a, a much more robust change as well. So muscle concentration at rest, you know, 10 to 15 micromoles or during a really intense exercise. Oh, maybe there's a 20 fold increase there. This is, this is not um, a 50% increase. I mean, you can get these things to really ramp up um, your ADP levels. And so your ADP really increases, AMP increases even more than that. And your ATP can fall a lot more than is 
than was originally suspected and is still printed. So what are the consequences of reducing your ATP? So cross-bridge cycling, right? Think rigor mortis, strong bond versus weak bond. Um, if we're going through sliding filament theory, right? The filaments are actinomycin, they're sliding, whatever. So cross-bridge cycling, we make cross-bridges between actin and myosin, those myosin heads and the binding sites on actin. And in order to, to reestablish a weak bond after uh, a power stroke, right? It's a stupid word, but, but after um, we've gone through this sort of bent necked um, stroke of, of the uh, myosin, we have to release, we have to break that bond. To do so, we need a weak bond. What do we do? We bind ATP to it. If you have ATP bound or ADP and a phosphate, you have a weak bond between actin and myosin. If you have just ADP or nothing, then you have a strong bond. So if you don't have any ATP, to bind, you don't get this weak bond. You're not going to release. You get this like good luck um, going through cross bridge cycling. Let's get rigor mortisi. Um, and but the, the the power output also. If you think about ATP on the decline, you need ATP. You need ATP to go through this cross bridge cycling. You're not gonna you're not gonna do it. You're not gonna do those little power strokes without uh, ATP. You have to you have to consume these things. And this is just one sarcomere. This is this is you know there's your there's your M line. There's your Z disc. Here's your myosin. Here's your your actin, and all of these myosin heads, and every single one of them is going to, in every single little power stroke, you are consuming ATP, releasing a hydrogen ion, releasing that phosphate. And remember, we have um, in our these myofibrils, right? So there's a whole muscle. There's fascicles, which are bundles of fibers, and fibers are bundles of these myofibrils, which are these strings of these longitudinal strings of, of sarcomeres. And we, I mean, we have thousands of these sarcomeres. And so I'm mean, getting sartorius. I mean, we're getting uh, really long in, in, in some of these things, but even just like medial gastroc, 15,000 um, sarcomeres long. I like I mean for one of these you know muscle fibers hey, you know, we're going back to some old lectures here of uh, fibers don't often extend the whole length of the muscle sometimes they do other times they don't so if you're in abs you're not going the whole way if you're in the sartorius right you're you're unlikely you might go the whole length but you're unlikely to go um, the whole length of that thing that's a super long muscle maybe 174,000 sarcomeres long, something like that. But, but you have so much cross-bridge cycling taking place. Uh, I mean, that's just one myofibril is, is generating so much ADP and so uh, many phosphates and, and, and so, much, uh, so many protons. And just getting low on ATP, you, you need for the ATP aces, right? There's myosin ATP ace, you know what that is. Sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium ATP ace, you know what that is. You have to pump calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum against its concentration gradient. How do you do that? You consume ATP, right? So you have to consume ATP to do that. There's also um, the sodium potassium pump, that sodium potassium uh, ATPase, you have, to, you have to pump that where it belongs against this concentration gradient, the sodium potassium, you have to shove those against concentration gradients, you consume ATP there. So all of this stuff can get a little bit messy. If you get low on ATP, all of these things can get a little bit messy um, with just low ATP. And as you build up ADP, this is more problematic. Changing that ratio, more problematic. Building up ADP and a MP as well. So remember, ADP really builds up during strenuous exercise. So well before you reach that, that sort of peak level, you start to seeing some mucked up kinetics, whether it's calcium being affected, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, that can get a little bit leaky, pump function compromised. But then the release, uh, you remember the ranadine receptor, uh, this has 
uh, ATP and ADP, uh, little sites where these are going to bind. And there, it's a competitive binding. You know what competitive binding means? We're talking about enzymes. And so ATP and ADP, uh, they compete with each other for this sort of doorman job of, of releasing the calcium uh, into the cytosol. ADP is just a worse doorman. It's old, it's, it's sort of this curmudgeon, this sort of ATP, very good doorman. So if you change that ratio uh, of ATP to ADP, it's just like when we were talking about those large neutral amino acid transporters and how do you get more tryptophan across the blood-brain barrier aboard those large neutral amino acid transporters, change the ratio. Change the ratio of tryptophan to your branched chain amino acids. And let's purge some branched chain amino acids and who cares how much tryptophan is there, but let's, let's increase free tryptophan, you know, albumin, let's get it off of there. And changing that ratio is going to alter how much tryptophan gets into the brain. Changing the ratio of ATP to ADP is going to affect uh, the doorman business and the, uh, the ability to release your calcium better with ATP, worse with ADP. So you're going to get compromised function of the sarcoplasmic reticula. Um, and then also think about cross-bridge cycling. So if ATP is attached, you have a weak bond. Right. A weak bond, if ATP is attached, if just ADP is attached without a, without a phosphate, you have a strong bond. So if ADP builds up, there's an effect you expect to see. Now, you have to release the ADP so that ATP can rebind. You're not going to bind ATP to, to a site where ADP is already bound. You have to release that ADP so that ATP can bind. If you have this giant abundance of, of ADP, you don't release it as well. So cross bridge cycling is impaired, right? Because you're delaying that time course of cross bridge cycling. Um, so you're prolonging it. You're, you, you are not releasing the ADP as effectively as quickly. And so ATP isn't binding and cross bridge cycling gets impaired with this giant buildup of ADP. And then the last mechanism of this is, you know, if you are at rest, right, you have ATP, you have ADP, you have AMP, all of them are there all the time, but you have different ratios of these things at rest. And so if anyone ever gives you these, you know, the holidays, you have like, okay, here's your candy canes, here's your uh, chocolate chips, here's your, I don't know what the hell that is, and your sugar, and and whatever, more chocolate chips, we, we went crazy with that. Um, but if you go into exercise, you are changing the ratio. You have the same amount, basically, you have the same amount of these things, but you're changing, oh, okay, let's get twice as many candy canes and let's get rid of the chocolate chips. And, the, and, and so that's really what happens during exercise is ATP, ADP, AMP, they change their ratios. Now, the adenylic kinase reaction, right? So you get your two ADP and you create one ATP and one AMP. So we're really building up AMP and trying to maintain ATP the best we can, creatine kinase, adenylic kinase, trying to maintain ATP levels the best we can. We're not really maintaining them and they're certainly not going up, but we're trying to keep them at a, at a manageable level and AMP in doing so is really climbing up. Now, when that happens, how do we preserve our ratio? Because that ratio is important. That ratio of ATP to ADP, ATP to AMP, those ratios are critical. So we just use AMP deaminase. Um, remember metformin, that drug that blocks AMP deaminase? Well, we're going to run this AMP deaminase enzyme, this reaction, and create IMP and ammonia. Um, NH3 uh, is ammonia. Um, NH4 would be ammonium, this protonation of, of ammonia. But NH3, ammonia, we're going to create a bunch of this stuff. And there's a, there's a possible mechanism with fatigue here. Um, you're not releasing any energy in this reaction, your creation of, of IMP. But by the time you go through this reaction, by the time you do your IMP and ammonia reaction, you're probably very acidic. You probably have a lot of hydrogen ions floating around. So what does your ammonia do? Well, it becomes a 
a cation, right? It, it becomes a positively charged thing. It, um, you accept that hydrogen ion and become ammonium. And so some of that NH3 gets protonated. You're buffering the pH a little bit in doing so, but building up the IMP and NH3, uh, while this might be good for ratio reasons, there's an explanation for the central fatigue because some of that NH3, we can cross the blood-brain barrier. And it's a little bit messy, you know, what's going to do it, rate of perceived exertion. Um, I mean, this is not a pretty regression model here. It's sort of all over the place, but um, it's a bad R squared with a compelling p-value. Uh, but your cerebrospinal fluid and the rating of perceived exertion, the more intense uh, you are exercising, the more NH3 is crossed, the more ammonia you have crossing the blood-brain barrier, and the more fatigue you can generate this way. And so there's, it gets a little bit messy eating carbohydrates. Now we talked about the effect of carbohydrates on you know, insulin and on you know, that, that lethargic sensation when tryptophan crosses the blood brain barrier and how carbohydrates are uh, at rest are going to contribute to serotonin metabolism in the brain. But during exercise, they're warding off serotonin metabolism in the brain, the conversion of tryptophan to serotonin. Uh, and carbohydrates also attenuate the NH3 accumulation, the cerebral uptake of, of ammonia. So carbohydrates are good during exercise for a few reasons. Okay, so this is going to be it for the day. Um, we'll just go through the reasons that ATP ADP ratio matters for fatigue. So one of them is cross bridge cycling needs, right? ATP, you need it. You need ATP. You have myosin ATPase. You have sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. You have that um, sodium potassium pump. Um, there's an ATPase there. You need ATP to, to go into your ATPases. So power output, sure, maybe. Probably not one of the bigger ticket items here. Um, so there's a sodium potassium pumps, right? So the, there's a myosin ATPase there. Sodium potassium pumps. Um, we need ATPase here. Uh, as well, ATP availability there as well. Cross bridge cycling. If you build up a bunch of ADP, you are not going to release your ADP as effectively. And when that happens, the the time course of of cross bridge cycling is is prolonged because you can't bind a new ATP to it as long as the ADP is there. If you can't bind a new ATP, you can't transition into the um, weak state. So you can't do the cross bridge cycling. Those sliding filaments can't slide. Um, sarcoplasmic reticulum, these guys, the reticula can become more leaky. Calcium pump function can be compromised. ADP outcompetes ATP for those ryanidine receptor doorman jobs. And so the release of calcium is, is reduced. And then the cerebral uptake of ammonia um, that can influence neurotransmitter function. And so some central fatigue mechanism there. And this is what we've covered so far. So ATP, ADP ratio. Um, now we talked about the hydrogen ion in terms of, of um, burning sensation, and there's a voluntary cessation of exercise, but uh, we'll talk about it from the perspective of fatigue also. And we, we talked about tryptophan and serotonin, but this is what we'll cover all these, these little green fellows we'll cover on Wednesday and then on Friday we'll do central fatigue. So what questions? What, what, hit me with your questions for today.